and they're each going to get their own unique viewpoint what it means to them. So we're first going to have a stakeholder panel that is with us right now and that will introduce everybody. Um, after they speak, there's going to be a time for a group activity and we're going to ask people to kind of group together in groups of four or five people and the panelists are going to gather throughout the room to kind of help facilitate the conversation. We're going to have some um, questions up on the screen to help guide you with that. And after that, there's going to be a 10 minute break time. And everyone can come back refreshed from that. We're going to have a second panel come up and um, Deb will moderate questions for them. And then we'll wrap it all up with a QA for any of the panelists in the group. So at this point in time, I'd like to hand the off to Deb again. Thank you, Barbara. And um, uh, Barbara Birch is our um, manager of research and development at QM and really was instrumental in putting this together. So thank you very much for doing that, Barbara. So uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, for the first panel. And I'll start with Ashley here in the middle. Uh, Ashley is a, a, a doctoral candidate in the higher education program at the University of North Texas. She's also a graduate assistant for student services at UNT New College in Frisco and an intern for Newark Thrives, the city of Newark's out of school time network. And Ashley is here gonna represent the, the student voice here on the panel. Um, uh, next to Ashley to her, her right is Paul Gaston is uh, the Trustees Professor Emeritus at Kent State University, a longtime consultant to Lumina Foundation, the author of Higher Accreditation, How It's Changing, Why It Must, and the Chair of Credential Engines Quality Assurance Advisory Group. And he is going to uh, represent the perspective of a foundation in regards to the questions that we're asking. <laughs> Uh, uh, at the end, is, uh, Dr. Andrea Schwegler is an associate professor of psychology in the counseling and psychology department at Texas A&M University, Central Texas. She's also a program coordinator for the Master of Science in Education Psychology program. And uh, she's representing, I, I, I think you're probably representing the faculty and the institution view in many ways on this. And uh, Dr. Greg Von Lehman is the former provost of the University of Maryland University College, currently serves as special assistant to the president for cybersecurity. He is a consultant to quality matters on the EQIP pilot. And uh, Greg is going to represent the administrator's viewpoint given his uh, uh, long experience in that area. So I want to kick this off. And I think I'll start the, the, the first questions are for Andrea and Greg, and you can um, uh, answer them in any order. So um, the question really is, it's, <laughs> it's one question with many legs. So let me uh, um, ask, what does rigor mean to you and at your institution or organization? What is it and w what is it not? And so you might consider um, talking about things like its use in determining transfer credit or substitutions for prerequisite? What does it mean? What do you think it means to students at your institution and um, how your institution uh, evaluates whether or not a learning experience is rigorous? So you can take those many pieces of this, what is rigor and what isn't it uh, in any order. Want me to start? Okay. <clears throat> Here's my 20 page answer. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Whenever I was coming up with ideas to, to talk about today, this is not just me. I invited my colleagues in the college to, hey, what do you think rigor is? How do you know you have it? And some of them actually took me up on the offer and they engaged in conversation with me. So I took notes from what they had to say from their emails and their conversations with me. And I tried to synthesize a little bit of what came out in the discussion. And what I found was that this is a really nice conversation to have with your faculty because we all think we know what rigor is and we all assume that it's there. But when you actually try to put it in words, it is very um, complex and it's very multifaceted. So I'll give a quick rundown of a couple of things that my colleagues said. And one of them is that it's planning. And it's planning at both the course level and the program level. You cannot build rigor into a course in isolation. You need to develop that across the program because a course fits into a degree plan and what students are doing. They need to see that direction. 
appropriately leveled learning objectives that came out that was a very common theme and what that means is students need content mastery and to demonstrate what they've learned in a course not just general intelligence to be able to get through it so that was something important to my colleagues accountability for teachers and that boiled down to having standards but then enforcing those standards it's not enough to put something on your syllabus you actually have to live by that and enforce that Accountability for students was also very important, and one of my colleagues said this in a great way. She said that in her hybrid course, she gets up in front of her graduate students, and the first night she says, do not believe anything I say. Now, that's a bit unnerving maybe for students to hear, especially when you're coming from that traditional perspective of the sage on the stage and you write down everything. What she did, though, was make the point that I'm not going to be with you whenever your colleague challenges you when you're in your profession and they want to know why you're doing it this way. You have to be accountable for that literature, for that best practice, so I can guide you. But it's not enough to say, because the teacher said so. You need to know that and own that for yourself. So accountability there. Active student engagement. We are training professionals, especially in our graduate programs in higher ed leadership and in counseling. So students actually need to do in the coursework what they're going to do in their career so actually having these meaningful uh, products of learning and not just test taking and things like that this is also true at the program level i have a required thesis in the program that i coordinate it's not enough for students to go through all the classes and get ready for that without actually doing the research project that's a completely different step so you have to have that at the program level as well where they demonstrate that um, Connections are very important. Connecting your prior knowledge to the current course, to what you're gonna do in the, in the profession. And I think that's something that, it speaks to those prior learning experiences as well. If students can't explain that connection, then we don't need to be crediting that. They need to see how that fits into the degree plan. And then of course, things that come out of the quality matters, like alignment and assessment. Assessment plans are very important, but you're gonna have threads in your program that aren't just on your assessment plan and you need to account for those things, and that's where that planning comes in. And then finally, and I'll, I'll take a moment to pause, um, is art. As I'm going through all of this, I'm a teacher at heart, and I'm classically trained in education before I went into psychology, and a seasoned teacher knows what you mean by the art of teaching. There's something where you can curate materials and stage them in such a way that students have a learning experience that goes beyond those objectives. And I don't think we can mandate that. We certainly can't require that. But what we can do is get teachers who are looking for that kind of experience where it's meaningful. Students get in a flow state where they're working really hard, but it doesn't feel hard. So those kind of things is an element of rigor that's really hard to define. Wow. Well, that's great. <laughs> so, so Greg, we'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, well, I think I, I would agree with just absolutely everything uh, Andrea has said. Uh, but I think I would add something to it. Uh, rigor has two components in my view. Uh, there are means and there are ends. And I think everything that Andrea has spoken to very well, in a very well informed way, uh, are all things that pertain to the means. Planning, accountability of faculty and students, um, student engagement, uh, I heard some active learning uh, uh, kind of an echo of, of Chickering and Gamison uh, there and so forth. I think these are all things that are certainly important to rigor, but I don't think, uh, but I think there's more to be said. And I think uh, what's more to be said is about the, the outcomes that you're aiming for in all of those uh, activities uh, that Andrea described. I think it's the outcomes that really anchor the rigor of an academic program. Uh, so at UMUC, to reflect uh, an institutional view, um, and you're all very sophisticated, I think you would, you would say very much the same thing, uh, how do you define the appropriate program outcomes? Uh, well, it's a, it's a combination of, uh, of kind of faculty intersubjective agreement based on, on their academic preparation. It's reference to appropriate uh, discipline-based uh, accreditation standards that are common in business or computing uh, and other fields, uh, and also informed uh, by industry boards uh, or appropriate boards of experts. 
Um, at UMUC, we're a very large uh, university, large uh, military population, large online population, um, close to about 90,000 students uh, now. And um, uh, most of them are part-time learners. We have very few first-time, full-time freshmen. Um, uh, average age is 30, 31 at the undergraduate level. Uh, most working, most married. Um, so these are people in school really to improve their employment prospects. And so uh, having well-informed uh, program objectives uh, that, um, that kind of echo or reflect what the market is looking for uh, is very important. And those outcomes include not simply uh, the discipline content, you know, whether we're talking about management or cybersecurity uh, or uh, some other field, uh, but also other outcomes that employers are looking for. And we all know what these, these are, you know, the ability to think critically, um, uh, to be able to communicate clearly, both in writing and orally, uh, to be quantitatively literate uh, at some level, to be technology fluent. Uh, these are all also important outcomes that, uh, uh, that really cross all discipline boundaries and are, are coveted and appreciated by, by all employers. Um, from an so I would say uh, all those things that Andrea said are very important and uh, uh, it makes sense that you would say those things because they reflect kind of a, the faculty point of view. But I say rigor really starts with the, the outcomes of the program um, because otherwise all those activities um, are really misguided. They're, they don't have the, 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 the appropriate aim or end um, for which you're trying to engender uh, mastery. Um, there are other uh, vehicles that are, are used uh, to promote those objectives. Um, I'm sure at your university uh, and the other universities uh, represented here, uh, rubrics are used to communicate um, the expectations to students uh, and to kind of reflect what is expected uh, by the institution in terms of, of rigor, um, not only in terms of the academic content, but also uh, the other qualities uh, that I mentioned. And very important is a feedback loop. Um, and <clears throat> all of us are very familiar with learning outcomes assessment. Uh, at UMUC, we experimented with, uh, I think it was called the academic profile, and then it was called the EPP. I forget what that acronym stands for. Uh, both of those things for us presented a lot of methodological um, in inferential challenges. Uh, and so now all of our uh, learning outcomes assessments are embedded assessments. So as students go through their work, uh, we're collecting data on how they are doing. And of course that feeds back into the faculty conversation uh, about whether or not what we're doing in our particular courses uh, really is engendering um, the, the mastery of those outcomes uh, that we're aiming for at the course and at the, uh, the program level. So let me stop there. Okay, thanks Greg. Okay, so, so Ashley, um, um, we'd like to hear from you to, to, not that you can represent all students everywhere. We understand that this is, this is Ashley's perspective, but to try to take the student perspective on this, um, your definition of rigor, um, whether you think, um, do students talk about or even consider whether the, the, the relative rigor of courses when they're making decisions, and uh, do they act on, on the idea that something's rigorous or not? So what do you think? Those are really good questions. Um, I guess I would start by saying that f from the student perspective, I think rigor is contractual, right? So um, are you teaching me what you say? Am I learning what you say you're going to teach in this syllabus? right? The syllabus is contractual. I think a lot of times, um, my background is in higher ed, and I, I think that sometimes we underestimate students um, about what it is that they think that they feel and that they are conveying that they are receiving in a class. Um, for myself, I'm a doctoral candidate, and so right at this point, as Greg mentioned, I am trying to gain mastery. 
So I am 100% looking for whether or not the syllabus um, or syllabi across courses actually represents the, what the teacher says I'm going to learn. That then goes into um, an issue of pedagogy. Students are, you will not get engagement unless you give engagement is basically, is basically what I'm saying, right? So if a student feels that you have set a climate and a culture that means that they will be challenged, that they will have fun, because fun still belongs in the classroom too, no matter what level, students will then engage. Um, and I think that that's important. I'm also sort of speaking from the adjunct faculty side because I teach as well. And so it's, it's interesting that I can go in between these two, these two identities, right? Um, the other, your other question about do students talk about or consider the relative, um, consider rigor? Well, I think it's important to recognize that no college students don't go around going, oh man, that class was not rigorous at all. It offered <laughs> absolutely no rigor. What they do say though is um, instead that students have a really remarkable way of speaking to what rigor is not. And they will say things like, this was a waste of time. I did not learn anything in this course. I brought the book home and had to teach myself. Why does the, I don't like lecture. Does the professor takes no opportunity to answer my questions. These are the type of things that students say and what they are alluding to is rigor. And essentially what they're also alluding to is if they've learned any, if they've learned anything or if they even have the will to learn anything, if they are coming into the classroom ready to give you their attention. And you know what that's like, right? That this is a cell phone generation. Students will have cell phones in their hand. And that says something. That says something when their head is down and they're constantly texting or tweeting or whatever they do these days, right? And so I think that that is extremely um, important that the academic success um, will follow after you set the cultural success, which is a rigorous environment. That means that faculty are also very much um, concerned about their pedagogy and how they're teaching and what they're teaching. So um, that, that would be, I have more to say, but I think that that would be sort of um, the biggest takeaway is engage them, they will engage you. You. So I think we're all going to want to hear what else you have to say, but let's go to Paul next. And, and Paul, the question for you is a little bit different. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's why would a foundation have an interest in rigor? Yeah. What's the foundation's stake in this and what is at stake in this? Yeah. Why did uh, Lumina Foundation put down the big bucks to send me to Fort Worth? That's another right. way exactly. of, of uh, exactly. asking that, uh, that question. Well, the understanding is that, that, that rigor, if we properly understand the word in terms of, of educational quality, uh, really offers the most inviting and supporting pathway to the foundation's big goal, which is also a national big goal, which is a significant increase in the percentage of Americans who hold quality uh, credentials. Uh, if that goal is going to be obtained, many of those individuals will earn them through distance learning. But for any of these goals to be meaningful, uh, you can't just make credentials easier to obtain. That would be one path, but it would be a meaningless path because quality needs to be assured. And, and that's really where rigor comes in. Uh, but I do say properly understood because we have really rehabilitated that word. And we use it in a positive sense that a lot of the people outside this room uh, are not going to understand. Uh, when we use the word, we talk about really what we want for students, that they, they become more critical thinkers, that they become more creative, that they exercise a healthy skepticism with regard to their preconceptions and their assumptions, and that they be alert for bridges that connect different sectors of learning, kind of like your example of, you know, disbelieve everything I say. That's great uh, preparation. So I think one way to do that is to echo 
uh, what some of my colleagues have said that we emphasize the equivalent importance of clarity with regard to outcomes, and processes, with regard to the demands that we're going to make on students in terms of time on task and how much it's gonna cost and what resources do they need. And we need to be clear about what the opportunities are that await them uh, once they receive the credential. So I think we share uh, as, as educators uh, in this regard, a practical and in some ways political challenge. One of educating the sectors whose understanding of rigor may be very different uh, from our own. And by that I mean the federal government, the Department of Education, and if you need examples of that, just think of the recent opinion of the, uh, the Inspector General with regard to Western Governors University, or think back a couple of years to the same uh, office and its opinion on solidifying, making more concrete uh, the credit hour. I mean, talk about a major step uh, back. Looking at the area of accreditation critically and, and making sure that that understanding that we share is understood by them, shared by them. And I would ask there that you compare a recent statement from the Council of Regional Accrediting Commissioners which seems really to get it in terms of distance education and the importance of outcomes, what we would call <coughs> rigor. But compare that to the American Bar Association, which has still the most stringent limitation on distance learning as a component of an educational program, reflecting, I think, in many ways, a profound misunderstanding of distance education. And then finally, political leaders whose view of outcomes may be very reductive and, and short-sighted. I'm gonna end with some suggestions about how we do it as, as educators, as institutions, as foundations, as people who, who have bought into this importance of, of rigor. I think one of the things is to tell stories of success of our students, to show how our students succeed. And, but then on the other hand, to be vocal in pushing back against ill-informed positions. And I don't mean being defensive, but I mean being in defense of our students and our teachers. I think we need to be pushing information to legislative staffers at every possible occasion in an attempt, sometimes admittedly a futile attempt, but nevertheless <laughs> a, a well-meant attempt to, to inform our legislators about the values that drive us and the success we're trying to achieve. I think we seek support for programs that are genuinely innovative, that are bellwether programs from, or from organizations such as Lumina Foundation or from the feds or from other sources that give support and prominence to uh, our best effort. I think we can do more to celebrate internal victories within our institutions so that we all become spokespersons for jobs uh, well done. I think we maintain a commitment to this organization. Quality Matters provides the single best platform for people who are committed to the idea of quality in education. And finally, I think we emphasize one of the virtues of Quality Matters, which is that it provides one of the few reliable bridges across that chasm between higher education and K through 12. And that is a that's a success story that needs to be, to be celebrated because that chasm otherwise is a scandal for us uh, in this country. So, Great. So I'm going to do one follow-up um, given that we're trying to manage our time. Um, and, and I'm going to follow up Paul's sort of charge uh, that we, you know, we make this case to uh, the ex external stakeholders who make the policy decisions and who enact the laws. And uh, uh, I think the challenge there is we've heard everybody's perspective on this and um, uh, it, it raises to me uh, the, the issue of um, measurability of the things that we're talking about. And I say this because I had uh, um, read a, uh, the Senate Committee on Health and, and Education um, 
was taking, uh, actually in a response about accreditation, was taking higher ed to task, pointing to academically adrift, and saying uh, higher ed um, uh, was not uh, um, meeting rigorous standards, students weren't um, writing long enough papers, they weren't uh, um, reading enough books, and therefore it wasn't a rigorous learning experience and then defining it that way. And then, this, and, the, and then later in that same paragraph, pointing to alternative learning outside of higher education as high quality learning. And so I, I ask uh, the panelists to, uh, for your reactions to the idea that rigor can be measured by um, things like the number of papers that you write and the, uh, the number of books that you read. And, um, and maybe I'll start with Ashley, because I do, she, she, she uh, um, teased us a little bit about having more to say, and I think we want to hear that. So I'll <laughs> start um, with you. So, so that's a good question uh, when you think about measurability, because that's how, right, we know that we've met an outcome. We want to be able to measure it. Um, one of the first things that comes to mind is inclusion. Um, I think that the way that we measure sometimes is counterintuitive to the students that we serve. So one thing is, for example, if you take um, something like Afrocentric pedagogy or, or if you're teaching African-American students, for example, the way in which a African-American student or a woman or um, someone, some, we're of all diverse identities, our epistemologies are very different. The way in which I know that I learn and that I measure whether or not I've learned something is quite different and it may not align with how many papers I write um, and how many books I, I read. So I think we kind of need to start there. And I guess what I'm really advocating for is, is cultural shifts in the way that we are thinking about what, me what measurement even looks like. Um, one thing that we talk a lot about is GPA or high achieving, we, we talk about high scores. Well, the literature says that for many of our students, just feeling um, collective uplift is a measure of them learning in the classroom. It may not always look like a high test score. We want it to look that way, but it may not always look that way. And so I think that we need to sort of um, maybe reconceptualize how we are thinking of measuring or what the outcome needs to look like, especially because we are moving in a direction where cultural diversity is huge. We are serving students who are from every part of the universe, and we need to be able to account for that. Thank you, Ashley. I'd like to ask the other panelists if they want to address the, the issue about the difficulty in, mm -hmm. in um, measuring, defining and measuring yep. these things. Uh, I'd like to, to weigh in. Uh, struggled with this issue for about three years in terms of the development of the degree qualifications profile, working with Peter Yule and Carol Schneider, Cliff Adelman. Uh, I think one of our conclusions was that, uh, just as you say, uh, ways in which a student will demonstrate learning will vary widely and all deserve respect. But that also means that meaningful statements of learning outcomes need to be accessible in terms of a student's ability to demonstrate the uh, acquisition or the, the uh, having uh, realize the benefits of, of that program or that course. And I believe if, if that is the case, if we can draw the attention of our policymakers to what students can do as a result of their education, we'll, we'll be there, or at least part of the way there. Go ahead, Ray. I think this will be um, a never-ending conversation. Uh, I'll say, first of all, I think that uh, state legislatures uh, and parents have ever right uh, to ask the question um, of accountability of institutions for their outcomes. Um, and, uh, and I think that institutions uh, need to be able to demonstrate to those audiences 
um, that they are achieving the outcomes that they advertise for their degree programs. The real challenge is that institutions um, are, are strapped for resources and, uh, and they are challenged kind of uh, by the inherent difficulty of, of formulating appropriate uh, outcome measures and then executing uh, on those, those particular measures. I say this as someone who uh, still participates on accreditation teams and um, you know, you go into institution after institution. I've been on middle states teams and uh, even though I work for UMUC, I actually live in New Hampshire and participate on NEASC teams. Um, you know, it's not unusual to go into an institution uh, where they still haven't completely implemented their learning outcomes assessment program, or if they, they have had a program in place uh, where the, the data is not very high quality, where your learning outcomes assessment office may be one person uh, who may have other responsibilities. And so um, I think it's uh, uh, the, the questions of accountability are, are just questions. And I think they, for the reasons that I've mentioned, uh, they are difficult uh, for, for institutions uh, to answer. And I think that once institutions are able to show legislators, in the case of public institutions, these are outcome measures, these are the data that show um, our successes and where we're challenged, and this is what we are doing concretely uh, to address these challenges. And oh, by the way, uh, if you want us to accelerate the progress that we're making in this area, we'd be very happy to talk to you about our budget requests. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Uh, I think, um, so that's my perspective on, on this particular issue. So Andrea, I'll give you the last word, and, and okay. if that last word can be in a minute or two, that'd be great. A one minute last okay. word. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, we are coming up on another accreditation site visit, and so assessment plans and what we are doing and getting our process explicit is on everyone's mind. And so when I was asking about how do you know you have rigor, we had all sorts of responses from, well, I know it because of my classes, because I have the rubrics, and I provide the feedback, and I have my students actually engaging in things they're going to do in their profession. And when we look at it at a program level, I, I take the student artifacts and we evaluate them by a committee instead of just relying on that class grade. And we use a different rubric because we're evaluating it in the context of a program. And then we can also fold in the curriculum process, which underwent a, a very large revision last year, where we have a, a set of people who start at the program, through the department, through the college, into councils at the university level and curriculum committees where they're reviewing things like program learning outcomes and course level outcomes and looking for alignment and things like that. So I think we are generating documentation for assessment plans so that we have something in place. And we go at it knowing that it's never going to be perfect and it's not static. It's very dynamic. Mm -hmm. So we work at this continuous improvement process. So we have this now and this is providing data and maybe we miss something. So next time we do it a little bit differently and we assess something else. So it's an ongoing process of continuous feedback, looking at anything we can think of that would be an assessment of what the students are doing and how well they're prepared. Thank you. So, so now what we're going to do is it's your turn. And uh, uh, this is sort of an aspirational list of questions for you to consider, uh, <laughs> uh, given the amount of time that we have. I think what we'd like to do is you to kind of group up whether you know, uh, you need to do this in ways that it's convenient for you, but what we'd like is to hear from you, then we can't hear from every one of you, so we want you to talk a few minutes amongst yourselves. Really, what we'd like to hear back is, can you reach a common understanding of academic rigor amongst even the folks that you talk to, and, and to, to report back to us what that is, and then, uh, to follow that up with any observations or questions based on uh, you know what you've just heard and what the panelists have shared so that uh, we can engage back about this so let's take time five ten minutes okay to have to, to I don't think you'll get too far down this list but if you can start with the definition of academic rigor what it means from your perspective <laughs> that would be great thank you and the panelists are going to come and uh, kind of uh, 
fine conversations to get into. And when we're done, if you guys could come back in case they're, when, once they're done talking, if you could come back in case there are questions for you, that would be great too. Okay. But we're supposed to circle yes, right now. Yes, right? okay. yes, yeah, yes. I never got into the other questions about evaluating alternative learning. I know. Well, well, that will be. Uh, I, I, you know, it may, it may come out that what's going to happen is the other panel comes up, but maybe an opportunity for you guys to, to uh, engage with the questions because we're not going to have the questions. Oh, I see. So, um, so there'll be another bite at the app. Yeah, I think we're going to somehow. I don't know that there's enough chairs, but we'll make, when the other panelists come up, once they're done, we're going to want kind of all of you up here. So.
Okay. So this is always the hard part, right? You, you get folks engaging, and then we need to ask you to not engage anymore. So uh, could I have the, uh, would the panelists come back up quickly? Greg, calling you. We'll get the panelists back here for here quickly. Um, and uh, what we, I'll, I'll um, I think what I'm going to do, and I'll get up on my seat for a minute here, is to, uh, you know, we will release you for a quick break, um, uh, and so that, uh, you know, uh, we can reset up. But I want to give you a chance to share back a little bit about the conversations. And um, I don't know whether you actually could come to a common definition of rigor based on the conversations I was hearing. Um, but I would like you to, uh, if you have any observations you want to share, and if you're too shy, I think we'll ask the panelists to, to reflect on what they were hearing. But uh, I want to give you an opportunity to, to reflect back based on the questions that you had and um, or the conversations you were having and any, any observations for the panelists. So anybody want to uh, give us a little report back on the conversation? Please. All right, Fernando. Yeah, we have some remote folks, so we're trying to be inclusive. Okay, wonderful. Yes, in our group, yes, we didn't get to, to a common understanding because we start Feeling like the layers of well, what does it mean, and how do you measure it? If you don't, know, if you can't measure it, as a colleague was saying, then we can't say anything about it. How is it interpreted or misinterpreted, depending on disciplines or colleges? For example, uh, practice or, or scenarios where where I say I'm rigorous because only five percent of my students pass class. <laughs> so, right. So take it to an, to an, an extreme. So it is a very complex yeah, issue. In, our, in, our, in terms of defining it, measuring it, and being so far All right. in common agreement. Thank you. Did anybody, uh, any of you have a, con uh, a con conversation or observation about the point about is rigor sometimes used as a barrier to new ideas or invitation or uh, innovation? Do you, do you hear that? Do you, is that a, um, Leah? Um. My discussion partner, Karen, and I um, talked about this a lot because what we're concerned about is the idea of open admissions and access and opportunity uh, balanced against academic rigor. Um, and sometimes the mission of an institution or the mission of an alternative learning uh, opportunity is you know, to give students an opportunity to try. Let me try this online course, maybe at very low cost, just to see if I can get my foot in the door. And without providing that opportunity, um, you know, we could stand in the way of somebody meeting their academic goals. So academic rigor gets more complicated when you think about the mission of an institution or the mission of a, a provider. Um, and what is the goal to allow students to, to get into a learning experience and maybe use that as a building block? Or is it you know, a barrier to entry? Okay, so context matters. Is that really the in, in, and mission? And mission, right. Go ahead, Cheryl. Well, I think we came to the conclusion there's no definition. Um, but one of the things, I'm also at an, an institution uh, where we have no entrance requirements, a two year. And some of our faculty feel like quantity, and I think you asked that question and it kind of got lost mm -hmm. in something. The number of assignments submitted or the number of things they have to read determines rigor. And that's not the case. If, if they're the same level of content, there's no building, then there's no rigor. So I think we have to dispel the myth of quantity equals rigor. And then we also talked about the amount of time spent. Does that equal rigor, the amount of time the student has to spend? Again, mm -hmm. there's no answer. <laughs> there is no answer. 
Well, uh, for the panelists, what did uh, you were out there having these conversations? Uh, do you want to reflect on anything that anything strike you as um, uh, in terms of resonating with how you felt about it, or actually seem something um, that you hadn't considered? I, I can make an observation. Uh, I was uh, listening to a group that was uh, talking about um, academic rigor in relation to alternative learning. Mm. And, um, uh, uh, and I think that's uh, a very important question, um, particularly for institutions that are open admission and uh, willing to uh, allow students to give it a try and uh, are inherently, because of their mission, uh, open to recognizing uh, uh, learning that uh, their students uh, may bring to the institution for academic credit. I think very important uh, in that conversation is the role of intermediaries. I kind of re conceptualize it as a, a supply chain issue. Um, so you, you have, uh, various forms of alternative learning that can be training in the military, it can be training in a corporate uh, uh, setting, it can be a MOOC, uh, it can be learning that a, an individual picks up on the job. And uh, uh, so I think there, there is a role for what I call market intermediaries in validating that learning. And so, for example, we have the American Council on Education, that evaluates uh, training in the military and outside of the military uh, for academic credit recommendations. Um, we have uh, learningcounts.org, um, which is an initiative of uh, Kale, which is kind of the gold standard of portfolio evaluation, ex evaluation of experiential learning. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the evaluations that are made uh, through through Kale's process also is helpful to institutions if that student that's going through the Kale process should come to us and say, Kale, learningcounts.org would give me so many semester hours credit for this, that, and the other thing. Uh, uh, and I think there are promising developments. Uh, I think the, the uh, credential engine, um, which uh, is that an, an initiative yep. of the Luminal yep. Foundation, yep. Uh, giving you as much credit as Thank possible you. here, Thank Paul. You. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I still have to get back. You know. <laughs> well, I'm doing my best. Uh, uh, you know, also is a, is, is a very promising development uh, in this area uh, because there are, uh, there are more and more offerings of alternative education, you know, whether it's coding boot camps, uh, whether it's industry certifications in IT, and I think uh, to uh, and, and I think also the the equip pilot, uh, which is an attempt to kind of get on the inside of alternative uh, learning uh, enterprises and to evaluate their products and to validate uh, the learning that happens there. So I think um, in this whole conversation about rigor, the the role of what I call market intermediaries who are looking. Uh, at alternative learning and evaluating it from an academic point of view is very helpful. Well, uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're actually impinging on your break time. So but let me just say this. I don't have to say anything else because Greg has just queued up the next panel uh, because that's what you're going to hear about. So what I'd like to do is get let, you know, let you take a, a quick break and hopefully you could come back. Um, but if you need to go to another session, this way you'll be able to do that. But we're going to take a quick break, and we will be done. Well, these guys will have opportunities to answer questions at the end of the next one, too. Deb, Deb I want to give a 20-second last word. 20 seconds. Which is that, that uh, rigor is current slang for really, really cool, which I discovered in a, in a sports story about Seth Curry, that his, that his three-point shot in a particular instance was rigor. And listening to these discussions around the room, uh, this gives me my first opportunity to use the word and to say they were rich, they were diverse, they were rigor. All right. <laughs> I love that. That's got to be tweeted out for sure. All right. <laughs>